Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. My first time to Chicago. Uh, beautiful place. Could be a bit warmer. Came from the mid-80s, I think, in El Paso. This is warm? Oh, it's all relative, right? I mean, I, I'm from Canada originally, so yeah, um, a little bit about myself. Uh, as you heard, uh, I'm, a, I'm a scientist. Um, I kind of got into curriculum development indirectly. I, I'm a protein crystallographer. Um, I was teaching in Germany back in uh, 2007. Actually, I was in Germany for 15 years. I had my own research lab, and I was teaching at the medical school there, the University of Lübeck, which was widely heralded as the best medical school in Germany. And I was teaching in a discipline-based curriculum. The Germans invented the discipline-based curricula hundreds of years ago, and so they're still pretty wedded to it. Uh, but we were talking about curriculum reform at the time. I was very let down by the fact that I'd be teaching liver biochemistry. Students would leave my class. They would go to the next class. It would be cardiovascular physiology. And then they would go to anatomy, and they'd be doing the lower extremity. There was no linkage. There was no interconnection. And it was disappointing. And yet we were expecting the students would integrate all of this information on their own. And so at that time, I started to look at emerging models in medical education curriculum. And I came to learn of the clinical presentation-based curriculum. And it, it really appealed to me conceptually. Uh, it looked like, you know, definitely if I were a medical student, this would probably be the way I'd like to learn. Uh, and if I were an educator, this would be the way I'd like to teach because of its relevance. So I uh, learned of what they were planning to do in El Paso. And the plan was in El Paso to it was to uh, start a new medical school. So I was recruited to El Paso in 2008. Um, and the medical school opened up in 2009. First medical school on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, dealing with an underserved population. We started with 40 medical students, but now we've grown to about 100. Um, the thing that really appealed to me was the idea of this innovative curriculum. So I thought, this is an opportunity for me to go and start a new curriculum from the ground up. Uh, a bit of a risk, but uh, definitely could be rewarded. So this is our team back in 2000, late 2008. When I arrived in 2008 in January, there were two faculty in the department. And so we spent a lot of time recruiting. And by the fall of 2008, we finally were up to about 20 faculty, which I would have thought was basically that's where we hit our critical mass where we could actually sit down as a group, basic scientists and clinicians, and begin to think about what our, what our goal was, what our curriculum goals were going to be. And once we had established what our curriculum goals were to be, we could establish a curriculum planning framework for planning each phase of our curriculum. Okay, and so we hit on these curriculum goals. And the first thing we wanted to make sure we had was context. We wanted our curriculum to be highly contextual meaning that students were learning everything in context. The relevance of the basic science would make sense and appear useful. We wanted, our, we never wanted our students to be sitting in class going, man, this is a drag. Why am I learning this? And we wanted them to know it immediately and see the relevance of what they were learning. Taking it up a notch, we wanted to be highly integrated. Okay, So we wanted to look at it from a holistic perspective. We wanted to teach everything holistically, pairing the basic sciences with the, with the clinical concepts, and making sure that the students saw explicitly the connections between the basic science and the clinical concepts. Make sure that they could see the causality of the basic sciences and the clinical presentations. All right. We weren't just going to make an assumption that students would see that. We'd make sure that they would see that deliberately in our sessions. Finally, we wanted to follow an experiential learning cycle. We wanted our students to base their learning on meaningful experiences. There's a lot of cognitive research that shows that um, knowledge development is sort of the transformation of experiences. So we wanted our students to have experiences daily that would motivate them, that would create intrinsic motivation for learning the, the uh, rigorous basic sciences, and, and to apply their knowledge um, you know, deliberately in delib deliberate practice sessions and so on. Okay. So this was basically, ultimately, this curriculum planning framework. Contextualization, the way we could achieve that was to 
plan each week thematically around an important clinical presentation. Okay. Integration. We wanted our clinical presentations to serve as our main anchor point for all of our basic science and clinical instruction. Everything would be anchored on those clinical presentations. Okay. And to do so, we'd be weaving things together um, so that they were based on that framework. And experiential. We wanted, we wanted our, uh, our week to follow an experiential learning cycle. So we'd start the week off meaningful, motivating uh, experience. It would set the stage for all the learning activities that followed during the week. So early on, we were pretty small. We still are a pretty small team. We've got about 250 faculty at our school, um, you know, and uh, not a lot of basic scientists. We saw that there was going to be a challenge in, in rolling out and implementing a highly integrated curriculum that was going to achieve all the goals that I just described if we had sort of our, your, your traditional decentralized departmental structure. You know, a department of biochemistry, a department of physiology, uh, your different uh, clinical departments and so on. And I'm not saying that it's not possible to do it this way, but we just saw that based on our, our size, we needed to we needed to do things centrally. So we came up with a centralized Department of Medical Education. We broke down those silos. So right now my department has about 26, 28 faculty right now. We're a mixture of basic scientists and clinicians. We even have some nurse practitioners in our department. And we have 70 to 80 percent protected time for education. Okay, so that's our chief goal of the, of the faculty in our department is to develop and implement our curriculum. The expectation is, is it will also engage in our normal activities. Basic scientists should be basic scientists. Clinicians should be clinicians as well. So there's 30% protected time, give or take, for research or for uh, clinical work. So this is the curriculum that we came up with. This is sort of a, a, a big picture overview. This is the first year of our curriculum. Uh, you can see that's broken up into organ system based units. All right. First thing the students do when they come in in July is they have a uh, society, community, individual, and Spanish immersion experience. They spend two to three weeks um, getting used to the community. A lot of the students come from uh, other parts of Texas. El Paso is kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so they get used to the unique culture of our border region even begin to learn some Spanish. So that's one of the elements we have in our curriculum is a Spanish requirement. So we have three weeks of ice breaking experiences and then we jump into the heft of our curriculum. We start with an introduction to health and disease unit, move to GI, musculoskeletal, and so on. Um, the scientific principles of medicine course is the centerpiece course of our curriculum. It is an integrated course that has all of the basic sciences and clinical sciences integrated within it. We don't have any discipline specific courses. We have one integrated course called the Scientific Principles of Medicine. The other three courses that we have that are linked with the Scientific Principles of Medicine course are Medical Skills, the Society, Community, and the Individual course, and Master's Colloquium. Master's Colloquium is designed to explore ethics, professionalism, the humanities, the arty side of medicine, right? So this is a uh, this is an organ system based approach. You know, uh, it's not, that's not unique in itself. It's what we do within those organ system based units that I think is really, really interesting. We move to the second year of our curriculum and we continue with the organ system based approach where we navigate from central nervous system to endo, use endo as a bridge into reproductive systems, and then conclude things off with the mind and human development unit. The mind and human development unit is designed to sort of sample the arc of human development from pediatrics through geriatrics and to incorporate some, some behavioral sciences and psychiatry in there as well. Okay. So that concluding unit really gives us a good opportunity to revisit many of the organ systems in the context of peds and geriatrics. We have a brief comprehensive pre-clerkship prep course that we're just rolling out right now and then we give our students some study time for step one. Okay, so this is the gist of what we do within our organ system based units. Everything is done within the context of clinical presentations. So here's the issue. So we know that there are at least around 70,000 potential diagnoses. So 
ICD-10 came out and we went from 14,000 up to 17,000 potential diagnoses. That's a lot to keep in your head, right? What's interesting though is since the 70s, when we went from 14,000 to 70,000 now, the number of overall clinical presentations hasn't changed. So the body has a limited repertoire of ways that it can complain, ways that it can express itself. It's the 120 clinical presentations. That's, why, that's how patients are presenting to physicians. That's why we should be teaching it within that context. So that's what we do. We, in the, the preclinical curriculum, our pre-clerkship curriculum, I should say, we explore about 80 of the main clinical presentations. Okay. So this is the very first unit the students have. Again, we don't have, we don't have a foundations unit. We don't have an anatomy block. We don't have a bio, you know, molecules to cells course or anything like that. We decided at the front end we weren't going to silo things. Okay, we we're going to break down the barriers and we we're going to use the clinical presentations as our platform to teach. So the introduction to health and disease unit is the first thing our students see. It's a five-week unit and each week is dedicated to these clinical presentations. But there's something to these clinical presentations. The dehydration, which is perfect because when they arrive in July, I mean, it's 110 in El Paso, and these city slickers from, from Dallas and Houston, they go up into the mountains and end up getting telejetted out of there because they're completely dehydrated. Um, dehydration is a perfect way to start. It's also good because it allows us to use it as a conceptual framework for homeostasis. So we explore homeostasis that way. Okay? The second week, failure to thrive. Okay, it's a way of us in, uh, introducing students to basic uh, molecular me mechanisms of cell growth and division, the cell cycle, nutrition, things like that. Okay, then we move into sore throat, which is really our, you know, uh, we, we jump into a specific pathology and a response to a specific insult. Then we move to fever, which is a more generalized response to infection. And then we wrap things up with which gives us a good opportunity to explore the healing processes and some of the signaling mechanisms that uh, underlie that. Okay, so this is the second unit in our curriculum. Or no, this, sorry, this is the third unit in our curriculum. This is GI. Um, GI takes a top-down approach. So we explore nine clinical presentations over the course of five weeks. All right, we start with the, the top, dysphagia, problem swallowing. We work down through nausea and vomiting, jaundice, abnormal liver function tests, uh, and we, we just successively work our way down the GI system using that approach. It's a very nice way of exploring the key clinical presentations that present themselves within that organ system. Okay? I could show you all the units, but we don't have enough time, so I'll show you another example of cardiorespiratory. So, very first thing we start with is chest discomfort. Okay, we work our way down cardio. We run out of batteries, that's okay. But we work our way down cardio until we get to abnormal blood pressure, and then we explore respiratory systems, beginning with dyspnea and moving to hemoptysis. Okay, so these are the anchor points for all of our basic science. So just giving you an example of biochemistry. So I teach most of the biochemistry and the nutrition in this course, in the Scientific Principles of Medicine course. These are the biochemistry topics we would normally be lumped into a single course, but you'll see that they're completely spread out across the two years. These are main key topics we would cover in biochem. I couldn't put them all on the slide, but it gives you an example of how this, this clinical presentation-based platform gives you a great creative opportunity to find meaningful places to put your content, all right? And so students actually get two years of biochemistry, if you will. And in some cases, we revisit the same concept, with, but within new contexts. Take nucleotide metabolism, for example. First time we cover nucleotide metabolism, I believe, is in musculoskeletal, okay? Joint pain, all right? So that's a, that's a good place to talk about gout, okay? And, uh, nucleotide metabolism within that context. We'll hit it again in, in anemia, in the heme unit, within a new context, all right? And then we could hit it again in mining human development when we talk about RCNS and special senses, when we talk about Lesch-Nyhan syndrome and other 
nucleotide disorders that can present uh, cognitively or with motor dysfunction. So that's the beauty of this is that you don't hit a you don't hit a specific scientific concept once. It's not one and done. You repeat it within within new and creative contexts. Okay, so everybody's done a complex jigsaw puzzle, right? Learning medicine is like doing a really complex jigsaw puzzle. So what are, this is my question to you, what are the key strategies or approaches you can take to solving a really complex jigsaw puzzle? What would you do? Are there any tools or corner pieces? Exactly, that's the first thing I do. You find the edge pieces and the corner pieces and you create a frame, right? You frame it out. And then when, once you've got that done, what do you, what do you use? Picture, picture on the box, okay? So many medical schools will focus on those individual puzzle pieces, but we try to give the students the picture on the box right up front and, that, and, the, and the corner pieces. What does that look like? It is a diagnostic scheme algorithm, a very simplified diagnostic scheme algorithm that forms the centerpiece of each of our clinical presentation-based blocks. So if you look at GI bleeding, for example, in fact, there's, there's literature, there's mountains of cognitive literature that shows that as you work your way from novice to expert, you restructure your knowledge. So as novices, medical students typically have very, very, piecemeal, fractionated, fragmented patterns of knowledge. And as you work towards expertise, you, re you reorganize it, everything into a meaningful structure so that it's usable and very effective. You, s you put some gastroenterologists into a room and you say, tell us how you worked your GI bleed. They will inevitably come up with something like this. Okay? So this is an inductive diagnostic algorithm that begins with the clinical presentation and uses key decision points as key branch points to work its way down to subsets of causalities. Okay? So first thing a, a gastroenterologist will look for is, where's the bleed? Is it upper or lower? So you know that's part of the history and physical, obviously. But there's a lot of basic science that also fits into that. How do you divide the upper GI tract from the lower GI tract? What is the ligament of trites, and why is it important in making that, that, that uh, separation, okay? So we use the, scheme, the diagnostic scheme algorithm as a way of not only facilitating introductory diagnostic reasoning for our students, but also we use it to attach our basic science to in a meaningful way. So if you decide you're gonna go down the upper GI branch, you go down a couple of other levels, and what you'll see is you'll eventually arrive at a pretty focused subset of diagnoses. But you can imagine the basic science that you would need to effectively navigate down this diagnostic algorithm. So why do we use diagnostic schemes as frameworks, as conceptual frameworks? There's actually some literature that shows that um, these things actually improve retention of basic science knowledge. Okay? They help students think like experts when solving problems. So that's one of the things that's really interesting, that students develop expert type knowledge structure early on. When you give them the picture on the box up front, they immediately begin to organize their knowledge into that meaningful way. And they can think through problems like experts. It's one of the things that blew me away when we first rolled out our curriculum was about three weeks or three months into the curriculum, our clinicians were saying, geez, the students are starting to spook me. They're starting to think like me already. And this is like three months into the program. We're start, and they're starting to think like me. This is, this is weird. So it was really good feedback that our students were developing very robust um, diagnostic reasoning skills. Okay? So it improves diagnostic success dramatically. They've shown that through studies. Okay? Um, and it attenuates loss of knowledge structure over time. So Let's compare and contrast inductive reasoning versus your typical hypothetical deductive reasoning. And I'll use sore throat as, as an example of that. Okay? So what you've seen now in those previous schemes is something called scheme inductive reasoning. Okay? Now contrast that with hypo de hypothetical deductive reasoning. This is a scheme diagram that uses hypothetical deductive reasoning. 
you develop a hypothesis, and then you deduce, based on your lab values or whatever, whether your hypothesis is true or not. If it's not true, you move on to the next hypothesis. Makes great television and TV drama. But it's costly. It leads to morbidity and mortality if you're not, if you're not an expert. And actually, experts use pattern recognition ultimately anyways. That's when their knowledge really is, is efficient. But when you're a novice or when you're an expert that's working sort of at the fringes of your comfort zone, it's much better to move into scheme inductive reasoning. Okay? So here's an example of sore throat. So you've got a patient who's presenting with sore throat or runny nose. What's predominant? It's the first question you want your students to ask that patient. Okay? Is it sore throat or rhinorrhea? Because if you can make that distinction, you can rule out entire swaths of, of diagnostic possibilities. Okay? And so with you know, three or four observations used effectively, you can work your way down to it's either a virus or a bacteria, or if it's a sore throat that's more than two weeks in duration, it might be something else going on. Maybe, maybe your patient has a fish bone stuck in there somewhere. Maybe there's a neoplasm. Maybe there's an embryologic defect. Let's take, it, let's take a deeper look. Okay. The key here is you've got to make these diagnostic algorithms simple. These are students that are in their first or second year of medical school. Make them simple, and they will use them very, very efficiently. And they'll often memorize them. It doesn't take very long for a student to commit that to memory and, and use it to, in diagnostic situations. Okay? The other thing we give our students with these scheme diagrams is we give them a process worksheet. Here's an example of a, I just cut out a piece of a process worksheet that shows you uh, what it is. It's a navigational guide for the scheme. It's written by a clinician, sort of narrates how you would work your, your way through a diagnosis using this scheme. It's very basic and concise, okay, and it provides a conceptual framework for integrating our basic science and our, and our clinical decision making. And everything, you know, you'll see a subsection at each branch point where you'll see key things. Ask about, okay, so that's your history. Look for, that's your physical or investigations, okay, those are your lab tests. So you'll always see that at each at each key branch point. These are not meant to be an entire compendium of all 7,000 different possible diagnoses. But we want the key ones. We want the big players to be there. Okay? And students will elaborate these schemes uh, as they advance through their clerkship years. Okay. So going back to the sore throat rhinorrhea, rhinorrhea clinical presentation week of the scheme, what are some of the basic sciences that you think would be important or relevant to this? Microbiology, yeah. So microbiology's got to be key there. Anything else? Immunology, yeah. How about anatomy? It's a throat, right? Pathology? Yeah, if we end up down here, we might have a neoplasm. Um, well, if it's bacteria, we might want some pharmacology too, right? So actually, that was one of the really cool things when we started to work on this. Is we'd sit down for an hour and just, just think about it. What can we do to really make this scheme jump up and be usable? And what, what are some of the key basic sciences that would be important for students to navigate through this? And in fact, in our sore throat week, which is week three of our curriculum, we have all of these things that are attached. Okay, neuroscience, cell biology, histology, immunology, anatomy, embryology. Okay, again, if there's an embryologic defect, it could be a problem there. Micropath and farm. All right. So these these are these disciplines are threads that are woven in to these weeks. I hope you can see that. Um, text is kind of small, but this is this is a week. This is our sore throat week, just to give you an example of student activities in a given week. Okay? So the first thing is the picture on the box. Monday morning, the students get the big picture. We have a clinician that comes in, gives them an overview of the clinical presentation. Pre presentation. 
introduces them to important diagnostic reasoning skills, okay? Maybe shows them a case, an exemplar case. The importance here is that picture on the box, that framework provides a meaningful experience to the students come out of that session and they go, wow, now I know why I need to know the anatomy. Now I, need, now I know why I need to know the pharmacology. So if it's done well, and it's generally done really well, the students have this intrinsic motivation to learn all the basic sciences that are attached to that clinical presentation because they see the relevance up front, right? So once we whet their appetite for the basic science, we dive right in. And we've got, you know, pharynx, nasal cavities, sinuses, throat and mouth anatomy lab, okay? Introduction to neuroscience. Remember, this is the third week of medical school, so we give them an intro to neuro, uh, neuroscience, and we talk about some of the important pain pathways. Uh, from the throat, okay? We do some immunology and microbiology, okay? Strep throat. We carry on with the theme of Im immunology and microbiology on our following day, okay? Including viral causes of sore throat. Wednesday's pharmacology, okay? Overview of antimicrobial therapy. And then we wrap it up with pathology. So what we try to do every week as we're introducing the basic sciences, is we try to start with normal structure and function, and then we work to abnormal, and then conclude with therapy, okay? So we kind of have a, a rationale for the sequencing of the basic science that we cover following that scheme presentation. On Thursday, we mix things up a bit. We have medical Spanish, and we have that Spanish thread, so the students learn some relevant medical Spanish, and they come from a variety of backgrounds. Some only know how to say cerveza when they come to our program, and others are completely fluent. So we put them in different groups. But they do practice and learn how to, you know, at least begin to ask a qu somebody who's trying to tell you they have a sore throat in Spanish. They can, they can uh, pretty much understand that. We do some epidemiology, outbreak investigations. Then we have medical skills. And our medical skills course is tightly integrated with the scientific principles of medicine. So every time they do skills, it's anchored to that clinical presentation again. And the schemes are used for medical skills. So you can imagine the things they're doing. They're doing patient history and physical. They're doing uh, a nose and throat exam. They're actually taking throat swabs and they're culturing them. That links back to microbiology because the next day they come in and look at their cultures and, and uh, say, oh, wow, my buddy here's got strep or something else. Something weird's going on. You know, it's amazing what you see on these cultures. Um, half our students should be in the hospital. Uh, but uh, they also learn about things like the Centaur criteria and the rapid strep test, things that are applicable to diagnosing a, a patient who you suspect may have sore throat and may need to take antibiotics, okay? We have a weekly formative assessment on Thursday too. So what we do is we give our students an opportunity to do some deliberate practice within the context of problem solving. So we give them a formative, it's just a count for nothing quiz that comes from our test data bank of experimental and clinical vignette questions. And many of these are integrated questions where we blur the lines between the disciplines. The students get immediate feedback on their performance and they even get the learning objectives e emailed to them. Well, the ones that they missed. So if the students missed a question, they'll get an automatic email listing the learning objectives that were linked to that question. Saying, hey, we want to go back and kind of revisit that concept. Friday, it's more about deliberate practice again and expansion, okay, or extension and synthesis. So we have work case examples. Uh, this is, these are small group sessions. Sometimes we do TBL, but these are generally small group sessions where we have um, clinicians that come in and work with groups of eight students, eight students per clinician in small groups, and they go through four cases. And these are carefully worked up cases where they all start with sore, sore throat, but they inevitably lead the students down different branches of that diagram, okay? And it's an opportunity for the students to work on their diagnostic reasoning skills, to revisit the basic science that's, that's attached to the clinical concepts, and to be in the room with the clinician and kind of you know, glean the, the uh, clinical prowess from our, from our experts. So this is expert-guided instruction in contrast to PBL, in PBL, you just throw a bunch of students in a room with somebody who's a facilitator but may know nothing about the actual subject. Here we have actual uh, experts. 
Finally, we wrap up the week with our master's focus, which is like the ethics and humanism element. And look at the, the topic this week, the antibiotic problem. So what is that? What's the antibiotic problem? Overprescription of antibiotics. So irresponsible, you know, you know, as clinicians, as stewards of society's resources, need to be more responsible with their prescriptions. And sometimes clinicians, and it's true, will prescribe antibiotics when they know in the back of their mind it's not it's not strep or whatever. We want students to really grapple with the ethics of this, okay, and, and have a good discussion. So that's kind of how they wrap up that week. So that was basically an experiential learning cycle, if you look at it from the, from the standpoint of Cold, who really saw this. Experiential learning cycle has four quadrants. The first quadrant is why. Why am I, you have a meaningful experience, it sets the why up. Why, why do I want to learn this now? Now I'm motivated. Then you move into the what. What do I need to learn? Do I have the resources to learn that? Then you move into the how, application of your knowledge towards problems. And then you wrap it up with synthesis and extension. Okay, so you know in this case you may be thinking may, in one of those cases in the work case example session you may have um, a pregnant female who has sore throat. And you're thinking, well, can I just give her any antibiotic? Can I give her any antiviral? Do I have to be careful here? So this is where you start to move into the synthesis and extension. Okay, and then the cycle continues every week. Here's another example of a week. So this is a, this is a cycle of learning in our abnormal hemoglobin week. Okay, so this is in our heme unit. Start with the scheme presentation. We have the basic science, okay, leading from normal, normal structure and function, including biochemistry and physiology. Then we move to pathology, and then we have this interactive problem-solving session where, where we really blur the lines between the basic sciences and the clinical. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, so the same thing basically happens. In medical skills, we have abnormal red blood cells. We, we do uh, lymph node examinations. We examine the spleen. We practice phlebotomies. We actually examine uh, peripheral blood smears in medical skills. Again, everything they do in that course is linked, as the science is, with the clinical presentation. Okay. So just sort of a wrap up of how we do it. First, we create that experience, you know, that we provide the clinical context and purpose for learning. Then we deconstruct the scheme into its component parts and provide the basic science using a variety of methods. We're very multimodal. We don't do a lot of lecturing. In fact, we're doing less lecturing every year. We're working more on flipped classroom activities and lab activities and things like that. Then we do some of the application so now we've got the knowledge. Let's apply it deliberately <coughs> through formative assessments, through feedback, through medical skills, and we continue on with the application uh, from a clinical perspective in the work case examples <coughs> and in our field work. And last but not least, we try to keep a lot of, uh, we have a minimum of three half days of self-study time or independent study time per week. Students also will go to a community clinic uh, once a month or twice a month. Usually it's once a month. <clears throat> and we try to match them with a clinic that's relevant to that unit. So if the units are in the reproductive systems unit, we'll try to get them to an OBGYN clinic or something like that so they can uh, apply their skills. So if you basically flip every one of these weeks on their side, we're doing an experiential learning cycle. And it's, it's sort of spiral learning in that every week we start the cycle again. And as they go through each week, their, their breadth and depth of knowledge begins to expand. And we can and their questions become more sophisticated. Um, you know, and <clears throat> you can just see it blossoming every week like this. Too much information on this slide. Other than this is a pretty good read. If you want to read Hardin's uh, uh, outline of integration, it's a good thing because when we talk about integration, we might not know what each other's talking about. My idea is say, oh, we need to be more integrated. What do you mean by that? You know, um, this, this paper kind of breaks it down into what are the different levels of integration. A lot of uh, programs are doing temporal coordination, timing of discipline topics are cor uh, correlated with one another. 
we're kind of up here on the ladder, multidisciplinary, meaning we've, we've, we're using themes as our focus of learning, and we've really, this is the important thing. Disciplines give up a lot of their autonomy. That's probably one of the challenges. When you are a basic scientist like I am, I want to protect my science. I want to protect biochemistry. I, make, I want to make sure the students have a rigorous fundamental understanding of biochemistry. But the other people want to make sure the students also have their bases covered in the other disciplines. So in order to become multidisciplinary, you have to give up that autonomy to some extent and be, be willing to work as a team okay, because it becomes a bit of give and take. Okay? Um, we're kind of working our way towards transdisciplinary now where we really eliminate the silos completely between our disciplines and we create sessions where cognitive integration is happening. Now this is what Nikki Woods causes, or calls cognitive integration, meaning that things are happening, integration is done in the mind of the student. You may have sessions that are proximate to one another and assume the students are going to be able to integrate the information. There's actually evidence that shows that that's not necessarily true. That integration will take place within the minds of the learner. There has to be unique learning experiences that facilitate that. Here's an example from Nikki Wood's paper where she shows very simply, if you take the same information, okay, and she was working with dental students, but she's just published a paper in uh, academic medicine where she shows it's relevant uh, in medical curricula as well. If you have a session that's basic science and then you have like a clinical concept session right after it, okay, or if you take the same information and you create an, a mixed case where you have the basic science, and then you immediately create a connection to the, to the clinical, and then you go back to the basic science, and you deliberately make those connections, you'll see dramatic differences in student performance. So here's what she found. She found that students who are in the integrated scenario, where you're making those, those clear connections, not only have uh, better scores on diagnostic reasoning tests immediately, but also their delayed scores. Or higher. And that's, that's just by doing some simple manipulations with your content. Okay? So here's an example of how we're trying to do that. Okay? So here's an integrated case study. In summary, it's, it's a Hispanic female who has sickle, uh, sickle cell trait. Okay? So we give them a case. Here she is. She's trying to ascend Mount Rainier. She's, she doesn't have a lot of climbing experience. She may be out of shape a little bit. Okay? She has sudden onset of severe abdominal pain in the left upper quadrant. Okay. So she's airlifted to Seattle. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Now we get the students to identify the key elements in the vignette up front. Wait a minute, this this is in this is in the heme unit. Now she's presenting with abdominal pain. Okay, so we go back, abdom, you know, the abdominal unit, or the GI unit happened two units before this. Okay. So we try to make sure that they realize that you can't just partition these organ systems uh, totally. Okay? So we ask them to identify key elements, and then we ask which investigations may assist with their diagnosis. So suddenly they're in the heme unit, but they've got to, they've got to reference the acute abdominal pain scheme and process worksheet. If they go back and review that, they'll see, ah, left upper quadrant, read through this, yeah, could be sickle cell anemia or a hypercoagulable state. Maybe it's a splenic infarct. That could be one of the possibilities. Okay, so what are what are some of the tests you want to order? Oh, they'll come up with a list like this. Abdominal exam, yes, good idea. Ultrasound, maybe a CT scan with IV contrast. See if the spleen's perfusing not well or not. You know, some, some biochem labs. All right, a coag workup would be useful and maybe a peripheral blood spin. So then we start to give them some of the results. So here we are. We, we see, you know, we see an enhanced CT scan of this patient's abdomen. We say interpret that scan now. So here we're going back to the clinical. So we've got a radiograph, and they're saying, well, what is that? Okay, can you see what that is? I don't know if you can see the contrast. The spleen is not perfusing very well. It's pretty patchy perfusion. So ultimately, as you say, there's something wrong with the spleen. We'll put a big arrow there just to keep them on track. But again, we'll ask them to identify all of these structures, go back and identify, and they'll, they'll be very good. They'll say, oh, yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. 
And they'll say, yeah, okay, that spleen looks a bit marbly. And we'll say, why do you think it is? Wow, maybe it's infarcted. Yeah. Okay. And we'll say, well, here, your labs came back now. Look at the labs. So investigate those labs. Well, if you look at the red blood cells, this, this patient does have anemia. AST and ALT are elevated too. LDH is off the charts. Albumin's normal though. So we'll say, okay, so you're seeing right here that AST and ALT, does this patient have some acute liver injury or is this more a chronic liver disease? Why or why not? It's very important to ask this question. Why or why not? And they'll rationalize it because the albumin's normal. Uh, it's more likely to be an acute situation. Okay? And then we'll say, well, tell us about the billy then, billy labs. Okay, well, there's hyperbilirubinemia. It's indirect. So is it hemolysis then? Yes. So we'll take them back to the anemia scheme and say, look at the anemia scheme. Normocytic anemia with increased destruction. Okay? It's probably somewhere along here. So we'll work them down that scheme. Inevitably, they'll get, they'll get down to probably an intrinsic problem with increased destruction. So a hemolytic anemia of some kind. But blood smear was normal. So we'll say, why would the patient's peripheral blood smear be normal if you really think it's sickle cell? Shouldn't we see sickling in the peripheral blood smear? And then after some struggling, they'll realize, well, we took the blood smear when the patient was down in Seattle, had been oxygenated, was resting, you know. Sickling's reversed. So those sickle cell smears you see all the time can be a little deceptive. You're not always going to see that. In fact, you'll probably see a normal peripheral blood smear. And then we'll have an opportunity to go back to the biochemistry. Tell us about oxygenation of hemoglobin and how that affects hemoglobin structure and sickling. Okay? So then we'll ask about more specific tests. We'll show them an electrophoresis. We'll have them investigate that. The patient's, here's the patient's hemoglobin. What is that telling us compared to a normal adult? Well, they'll justify that it's probably um, probably heterozygous, right? A sickle cell trait. And then we'll bring up some, some genetics questions. What is the risk of our offspring? So risk calculations for genetics. Okay. We'll do RIF, flip and PCR, okay? And then we'll do medical skills. So the students will do, will learn how to take a palp, they'll palpate the spleen, do an uh, abdominal um, exam, okay? And then also in that, in that situation, they'll be doing um, peripheral blood smears, lymph node exams, and things like that. So in essence, in that one case, we were able to integrate biochemistry and genetics, anatomy and histology, phys farm, path, methods for clinical lab testing, Diagnostic reasoning, imaging studies, everything. Yes? No. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, no. Because what we do is we, 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 we set it up early. We, we, it, takes, it takes an adjustment phase. I will tell you that. It does take an adjustment phase. Because most of our medical students, probably like yours, come from very didactic, undergraduate medical education. So they're used to sitting in class and being lectured to. And we did get some complaints from the students. Just, just lecture to me and tell me what I need to know. And we would show them the data. You know, lecturing to you is going to do you no damn good. You know, you need to get in here, roll up your sleeves and solve these problems because that's what's going to make it stick. Uh, finally, when they saw their step scores, they said, okay, maybe there's something to this. So I'll show you some uh, results, but it does take an adjustment phase. I'll, I'll agree with you. So now I'll try to play you a, a movie of a, a, another example, a little four minute video called The Lonely Accountant. And I, yes, so this is a session that's designed to facilitate what we call cognitive integration uh, between psychiatry, behavioral science, genetics, neuroscience, and so on. And so this, this is actually a, a presentation of a, a patient who has major depression. I hope you can hear the audio. And this is, we'll get student perspectives on this.
love to hear the cheering of the students in class. It's great. They, they watch a video of an interview with this patient, the lonely heart. They listen. It's always one of those. I have no idea. love to see that kind of enthusiasm. Um, and that's what we see in these sessions. The students really do appreciate that. They, they have the context. We blur the lines. So everything's integrated. Okay? And, and they perform well. So that's why I'm going to conclude. I'm going to talk about outcomes. Because, I mean, it's all about outcomes ultimately, right? And I, I'll tell you, I was the biggest skeptic coming into this. Because I, I want... Conceptually looked great, but when I realized I wasn't going to be able to teach the biochemistry the way I normally would, and I had to give up some of my autonomy, I thought, oh my gosh, 
you know, what are we going to see in terms of learning outcomes? Clearly, the clinical side was really strong, okay? But I was, I was um, concerned about the basic science. Well, the good thing, not a learning outcome, but an accreditation outcome, which we should all be concerned about, is we got, we got strong commendations from the LCME. This is what they wrote in their accreditation le uh, letter. So the pre-clerkship curriculum organized around and taught through clinical problems and diagnostic algorithms anchor and relate basic science concepts with clinical skills and behavioral science effectively integrated, clinic clinically relevant, and well received by the students. Commitment to uh, medical education is commendable. So we got high commendations. In fact, the LCME has said that this curriculum is, is one of the top in the country. And so we're very proud of that. But that aside, I'm like, well, how are students going to perform on step one? All right. So here we go. So here's performance of our uh, Four core cohorts of students that have graduated, well, our, our next cohort will be graduating this year. What we see at the bottom here are the MCAT scores of our students, blue line, versus nationally. So we're El Paso. So we're challenged by getting students that have competitive MCAT scores. Um, and we become more mission based, in essence. So we're looking for students who are going to want to practice in the border regions, want to stay in the community, things like that. So we're we're two to three points below the national average with our MCAT. But as you'll see with the USMLE Step 1 scores, things reverse. So we've been at or above the national average with our USMLE Step 1 scores. So the basic science is being learned. Now, I'm not saying that this is significant. All I can say to you is it doesn't look like this curriculum is harming our students. Okay? So that's probably what I would say. Now, how do the students do in the individual disciplines? Those of you who are familiar with uh, step one reports will know what this means. The green line, the vertical green line, is the national average. Okay? Our squares, our squares are our average. So we've been doing pretty good except for except for biostats and epidemiology. So we still have some warts, okay? And I think that we've resolved the problem with biostats and epi. We're having an external faculty member teach that course. We brought that course now into our main program as well. And hopefully you'll see um, some improvement as well. So here we go. I think there is merit to the idea that this highly integrated, sort of breaking down the silos, pre-clerkship curriculum can, can result in good learning outcomes. Yes. Right. Yeah. No, no, it's taught every week. And again, it's, um, it's part of our SCI course. So we're working right now on trying to explore the biostats and epi topics within the context of the clinical presentations, you know, without, without stretching it too much. So we are, we are, um, we're working on more problems. That was the problem with the biostats and epi was it was just a lecture-based course with no problem solving. And math, boy, you know, if I talk to my 13-year-old who does math, he's got like a 40 problem set, you know, and he'll say the first 20 questions are tough, but the second 20, he's got it. Right. So that's what we're doing with the biostats this year, making it more clinically relevant. Thanks for the question. So I, I don't know if we have time. Um, yeah, so if you have any more questions, I'd be really happy to answer. Yes. Yes, so at the end of each unit, uh, organ systems-based unit, we have a summative exam. And I would argue that it's pretty heavily weighted. It's, it's uh, pretty much all of their grade weighs on that summative exam. So we, we've been talking about... Um, finding more routine or regular summative assessments uh, across units. But right now, 100% of their unit grade is based on the summative at the end of the unit. Then they get an incomplete on their transcript, which is temporary, and we give them an opportunity to remediate at the end of the year. We give them two weeks of protected time to prepare for the, the remediation exam. If they fail a remediation exam, then they'll probably get an F on their transcript and have to retake the test. 
but we will send them all the learning objectives related to questions they missed on the summative as well. And so those are probably your weak areas. Maybe you want to start there uh, for your remediation. And generally, you know, we, we see our students have pretty good success on their remediation exams if you give them the two weeks to, to prepare uh, for it. You know, everybody's going to have one or two students that just were never cut out to be in medical, uh, medical school, and so we have to cut those loose too. So if they, they have to complete the four-year program in five years, so they can repeat a year. Yeah. Um, we, allow them, we allow them to fail two units across a, uh, a year. If they fail three units, then they have to repeat. Yeah, so once, once a month or twice a month, depending on uh, availability of community uh, preceptors, they go and do a, a four-hour community experience club. So that is, and we try to, we try to farm, farm them out to community clinics of relevance. So Emily Med would be for uh, sore throat and wound and, and stuff like that. Uh, for uh, GI, we try to get them in those experiences. OBGYN for the repro unit, things like that. So yeah, they're getting they're getting four to eight hours, four to eight hours a month of community clinic experience. The other thing our students have done is they've um, they've started up their own community clinic. It's a student-run community clinic, and uh, that's been very popular. They set it up in a uh, a very poor neighborhood in El Paso, and our faculty will volunteer and go out and work with uh, the students in the community clinic. That's become very popular. And then we have all these. Um, we have all these interest groups, emergency medicine interest groups, surgery interest group. Once students affiliate with those groups, then they get, they get opportunities to go and uh, shadow or precept in the emergency department and things like that. Huh. Yeah, you know, that was a challenge. We, Everybody that was hired convinced us that they were they were on board with this curriculum. We had a few that probably duped us uh, in that they said, yeah, I really like this, but as soon as they came on board, they wanted their own course, or they wanted, you know, I want eight weeks for my discipline. And those faculty eventually moved on, okay? It's either jump on board or we're throwing you off, you know? Uh, so, you know, it, it, takes, it takes a shared mental model. Uh, if you're going to pull this off, because if you have faculty who are shaking their heads and saying, "No, this isn't this isn't the way to do it," then um, it creates friction and tension amongst the faculty. So, we um, we've actually been very very lucky, I think, in getting the right faculty. Uh, it's been hard. The recruitment effort is, is difficult, too. But uh, as you work your way up to higher orders of integration, as I showed, it really takes a lot of communication, dedicated time. Um, and that shared mental model of what you want to accomplish. So, I mean, that poses unique challenges if you guys want to adopt a curriculum like this because you do have these segregated departments. Now, could you have a virtual department of medical education? Maybe you could. If you could ensure that certain faculty in the different, different departments had protected time for the curriculum. Yeah, that's something that uh, the school should explore. Yeah. We did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the thing is is that, um, and a lot of schools are doing this now. Uh, in fact, one of the things we did, I didn't show you, we moved to a three and a half semester curriculum now. So we end early. We're gonna be ending in February in the second year to give our students extra time in the fourth year to explore uh, their professional aspirations. Um, we had to do some selective debulking, um, and it came down to it came down to discussing between the basic scientists and the clinicians what is key and what is not extraneous but auxiliary material, you know, stuff that students, if they had time, uh, could explore on their own. That's one of the things that's challenging in this type of curriculum is you do have you do have some some weeks that are cognitively cognitively pretty intense and other weeks that are not so. And we're still working on evening out the cognitive load from week to week. 
But yeah, it did, it did come down to, because all of us were working within the constraints of that, that model that you saw, there was some give and take. And we had to say, you know what? Might be nice to know all the cutaneous nerves, <laughs> but guess what? Probably they can learn that later. That thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have been using that, uh, that topic template to make sure that we don't, just to identify gaps. And the thing is, is I think in the first couple of years, we realized that we had a lot of redundancies too. And it was nice to find out, you know, the redundancies, were they accidental? Were they intentional? A lot of the time they were accidental. You have one faculty member teaching something and the other one wasn't communicating. And so and that's probably going to happen more in a decentralized sort of departmental structure too. Because you'll have different faculty teaching the same thing. And that's, it may be useful, but it also may be a waste of time. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, good question. Workload. Now, if you put a carrot uh, in there for faculty, they'll work. Now, one of the things we did was uh, our, our promotion and tenure guidelines are very, very clear about the value we place on education. I don't know what your TNP guidelines look like here, but we place a lot of value on education. And in fact, you can get promoted and tenured for your endeavors in education at our school. Um, we, uh, we do follow workload. We make sure that it's well managed. Um, we, t we try to find at least two or three discipline experts per discipline to provide some redundancy, but that's not always the case. Uh, for example, microbiology and immunology, we've only had one faculty member responsible for each of those. Um, so it would be nice to have some more depth. I'm just sharing some of the sort of flaws or some of the challenges that we have with our program. Be nice to have some redundancy and multiple faculty that could share responsibility. Because if one gets hit by a bus, or you know, or decides to take a job elsewhere, you suddenly have a problem because you have a bunch of content that that person's responsible for. Um, so that's the wor workload issue. It hasn't been it hasn't been too bad. What was the, the other question? Yeah. Well, the administration of the curriculum is, is completely administered by the Department of Medical Education. So that is the administrative home for all of the educators, the 26 to 28 faculty that, that uh, implement this, deliver this, this program. We, uh, we, meet, we meet usually twice a month. We used to meet uh, once a week, but now we're meeting twice a month to talk about real-time issues and to plan ahead. Uh, it's usually two two-hour meetings every month. Um, and that's how we administer it. We try to stay, we realize that if you're going to make changes with the, with the curriculum, sometimes you have to be thinking an entire year in advance. And that's the thing that's actually been good about this departmental structure is we, we're actually really nimble. We can, make, we can make changes. You know, you think about, you talk about, oh yeah, changing curriculums like, like turning the Titanic around or something like that. And we're actually like a little motorboat because if we see a problem, we're all together as a team. We've made a lot of big changes. We've moved entire units around between years, uh, and you know, to get to where we are right now. And that's been afforded by the fact that we have a, a centralized department that administers this curriculum. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'll be around for more. Appreciate it. <laughs>